The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan. This clearly may be something there beyond the realm of man. And until you thoroughly tested every last post just True, Dr. Zayas. Well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Red Car One Company. Here we go, higher side chatters. Another day, another dive into the deep end of this weird world with an exploration of elite factions, occulted ideologies, geopolitics, covert operations, and more in the proverbial Pandora's box that keeps us trucking along this conspiratorial path. Because when a lot of us get our first glimpse of the hidden hand, the tendency is to see an overarching oligarchy controlling all of the world like a debilitated marionette. But as we go deeper, many of us realize the power path splits into so many divergent directions that the tangled web of secret societies, think tanks, corporate interests, bloodlines, networks, and covert operations seems too knotted up to ever fully untangle. But all hope is not lost, ladies and gentlemen, because today's guest has been dedicated to holding a microscope to each thread woven into the conspiracy cardigan and has been basking in the warmth and comfort of his nuanced understanding for nearly a decade. He's the man known as the recluse of Babylon, or just recluse to his friends, and his blog Visup has been tracking his conspiratorial and weird stuff research journey all along the way, and I'm really psyched to get into it. Here he is, the man who knows the plan, blowing more minds than the U.S. military, recluse, my good sir. Welcome to the higher side. Uh, thank you for having me, Greg. Yeah, man, you got it. I really appreciate you being here. I know it is a little rare for you to do interviews, which makes this all the more sweeter for me. But because this material can get so complex and many researchers have many different takes on the alternative, can you tell us a bit about what got you into these things and break down your overarching perspective and worldview when it comes to these sorts of topics? Uh, well, like a lot of people, I probably started to get into this stuff at least heavily kind of during the Bush two years. I was kind of brought up, though, in a conspiratorial-oriented family. My father, who was a Green Beret, was quite interested in this kind of stuff. I can actually remember listening to William Cooper with him probably at some point in the early to mid-90s when I was only, you know, maybe 10, 12 years old or something <laughs> like that. So I've wow. definitely been, yeah, around this community for quite a while. And certainly I wouldn't have described my dad as a birch or anything like that, but I would say that he had been around some of those circles in his day before. So uh, I definitely I have, I would say, a pretty decent, long-standing view of the community on the whole. And as far as it goes to my approach, I think that probably started to emerge around 2011 or 2012, somewhere thereabouts. And it was really spurred when I first started to look into um, the Oklahoma City bombing. And as a result of that, kind of looking into a lot of the you know white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups that Timothy McVeigh had been associated with. And that really kind of opened up a whole new universe of groups and what have you that you just don't see a lot of um, conventional conspiracy researchers delve into. And from there, I learned about organizations like the American Security Council and the World Anti-Communist League. And that spurred me to look into some very, you know, arcane topics that are very rarely addressed, even in uh, conspiracy circles. Mm -hmm. Amen, man. Yes, that is exactly kind of what I wanted to get into is how those elements are kind of left out of conspiracy circles. And to quote your blog, I think this does a great job of summing up the journey. You say, many that have asked these questions have been led down a path that will progressively defy belief. First, they learn of international organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Royal Institute, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, and similar think tanks along the lines of the Royal Society, MIT, SRI, and the Jason Group. And it is here that many rational people hit a wall, for the organizations that stand behind these groups are generally too esoteric for the layman to accept. For it is here that we descend into the realms of illumination, of masonry, and the so-called Society of Jesus, of legendary knight and assassin brotherhoods, where the line between Kabbalism and Nazism is forever blurred. And it is here we discover the occult, in other words. And that is a great setup, man. But the phrase where the line 
between Kabbalism and Nazism is forever blurred. That is so key because I'm trying to balance the show where we talk about pockets of power equally. And if we talk about the Germans, then I get yelled at for ignoring the Jewish elite. And the more I look, the less I can really separate those quote unquote teams. I mean, the lines are blurred, but I guess, can you give us any kind of clarity here? What are your thoughts on that specific line between Kabbalism and Nazism? Well, obviously, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of overlapping interests between these groups and what have you. And I mean, I'm sure when you're, you know, at that level of kind of the power brokers and what have you, you're almost inevitably, there's only going to be certain interests and so forth that people with that kind of power would even want to pursue. So I think a lot of times it breaks into sort of different visions of how things should manifest, that there are disputes among the elites. Breaking here. I'm trying to remember, actually, I think it's been a while since I even wrote that. So I'm trying to remember now briefly like what I was going with this with the <laughs> um oh gosh. Yeah, I'm actually kind of drawing a blank on that one right now. Sorry. No worries, man. It is complex stuff and we are just still trying to get warmed up here. But I do think you nailed it when you talked about that particular line. I think at a certain level that is the division. And you do have guys like Joseph Farrell talking about a fascist faction. I know your guy Chris Knowles also talks about this aspect a good amount. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim Mars would obviously be a big one, too. Uh, really, I think Farrell and Mars have probably been the two researchers that have really shaped a lot of the, uh, you know, occult Nazi sort of perspective and definitely research. I would say I have some issues <laughs> with. Fair. So, well, I think in case of Jim Mars, who's uh, one I'm somewhat familiar with, I mean, I definitely think he tends to go a little too far into the... Uh, Council on Foreign Relations Overlord perspective, if you will. I mean, the CFR obviously has a lot of power, no doubt, but uh, it's not the only game in town. And I tend to think in general it's been misrepresented by a lot of researchers as to what its initial objectives were and, you know, how it's kind of developed over the years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it, you know, it kind of emerged out of the round table groups, which had their origins towards the end of the late 19th, early 20th century. And they, in turn, actually seem to have been associated with an even more exclusive sect uh, known as the Pilgrim Society, which you very, very rarely hear addressed. I've even heard Alex Jones, for instance, who is obsessed with this kind of research, has deliberately censored references to the Pilgrim Society. Hmm. But anywho, in essence, the round table groups and the institutes that emerge from it, such as the CFR and the Royal Institution and what have you, were primarily concerned with expanding the influence of the British Empire, principally by reuniting the British Empire and the United States into some kind of, you know, political structure, along with a lot of the other crown colonies, such as Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and so forth. And that was really the primary focus they had on internationalism and globalism, if you will, leading up to the Second World War, it really wasn't until after the Second World War that the elite faction that are generally referred to as globalists genuinely became globalists. So even despite that, there was a long-standing, strong sense of Anglophilia within the Council on Foreign Relations sect. And I suspect to this day, there's still an agenda that's focused around the British Empire. And that's something when you kind of look into... A lot of the roundtable affiliates from Britain itself, a lot of these people actually became very opposed to the European Union beginning in the 60s and 70s. And ironically, a lot of them are usually considered to be staunch nationalists now in uh, the United Kingdoms, whereas obviously that's very different from how the sort of roundtable groups are perceived in the United States. I think I maybe lost point of what you were talking about there for a minute. So. Nah, man, I really love it. <laughs> I find this all so interesting. And I guess the simplification a lot of people are putting on it is that we have this Zionist, globalist, one world order, Jewish faction, and this other fascist, Nazi, nationalist side. And I guess I'm just wondering if these two are really divided or if they're just played off each other from a higher level, if it's more of a two puppets, one hand situation and just a divisive, polarizing dichotomy to get people trapped. Is that kind of how you see it, that maybe that separation tends to dissolve when you get to the higher levels? Yes, I mean, certainly. And I mean, there's a lot of, you see a lot of these, uh, you know, affiliations that are very strange. I mean, especially with the Zionist faction, 
certainly, because typically most researchers tend to affiliate them with, you know, the kind of Anglo-American elite and, of course, this whole CFR network we were talking about. But again, I would say that the CFR was very reluctant in embracing Israel in the first place. A lot of it seems to have been driven by the American partners. There's a lot of interesting theories as to why the American partners opted to back Israel. But regardless, they did. And the European partners seem to have very early become disillusioned with this. And nowadays, especially in the you know more modern era, I mean, a lot of the most vocal opponents of Israel tend to come from the EU. And that tended to create this sort of bizarre situation where increasingly Israel made common cause with the far right, especially, you know, organizations like the World Anti-Communist League, which, you know, were littered with many former Nazis, quote unquote. And, uh, you know, obviously this is a very strange situation, but on the flip side of the coin, Israel was sort of it was a lot of ways it was a natural alliance for Israel because the WACO also brought together South Africa and Taiwan, two nations who, much like Israel, were essentially apartheid nations. Mm -hmm. So there were these mutual interests there with uh, some of these other affiliates in this group. And yeah, <laughs> I mean, so it kind of begs the question, are they united in some sort of unified front, maybe in some levels of the different factions? But there definitely seems to be a situation where. In the case of kind of the Europeans elite, there's a perspective that Israel has really become an embarrassment and a major detriment to the greater global project, which, you know, is rather obvious when you look at the anger that Israel's existence causes amongst the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you have this kind of bizarre situation where increasingly the Jews have had to align more and more with Nazis because they're, you know, historic allies in the banking sector now consider them to be a kind of economic liability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but again, is this the actual situation or is that an elaborate ruse? That's kind of the question. And I don't you know, pretend to really know this. I don't think anybody really knows that. And we couldn't probably know that unless we're, you know, within the boardrooms of power and what have you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a very very murky situation that's probably not as clear cut, I think, as a lot of conspiracy researchers like to get into right and that i do agree with you on is there's a lot of nuances that get overlooked with these singular narratives and i try to avoid that as much as i can but at the same time you try to seek some kind of clarity and that kind of makes those singular narratives more attractive but one series you have that i really love is a nine part and counting one that you have called fringe the strange and terrible history of the far right and high weirdness. Because as I've been talking to guys like Chris Knowles and Gordon White and Joseph Farrell, I have really started to notice this nexus of far right fascists and how intertwined they are with the majority of UFO stories and ET whistleblowers, MK Ultra and Artichoke and these deep state torture and abuse projects, corporations like IG Farben and Merck, eugenics campaigns, and this crossroads between the occult and cutting edge technology. And this fascist side of the coin seems to be stepping further out from behind the curtain these days. But what can you tell us about this curious connection between the far right and what we could broadly call high weirdness or occult magic? I mean, how far back can you take this? Well, I mean, it definitely seems to have gone back to at least the post-war era when you had, you know, a lot of the UFO counters, the first wave of modern UFO counters, I should say, that broke out in that period. And in the case of Roswell, which is one of the, you know, obviously the major incidences of this kind of mythos, a lot of the generals associated with Roswell and the material would later end up being connected to the American Security Council, which was for many years the kind of pinnacle outpost of the far right in the United States. And it was also a vast intelligence network as well. Originally, it was designed to basically engage in blacklisting. It kept thousands, probably tens of thousands of records on American workers and their political views and what have you. And then later on, it became involved in just a host of incredible things, drug trafficking, supporting a lot of the Contras, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Well, anyway, with the ASC, um, they originally kind of became an intelligence organization in the early years to focus on blacklisting basically chronicling the political beliefs of American workers and what have you so the corporations could essentially discriminate against individuals of liberal persuasion. And then from there, they got into a host of major deep state activities. They've been 
linked to drug trafficking and arms trafficking, a lot of international terrorism, especially in the 80s with Contra networks and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and what have you. But um, from the very beginning, there were just a lot of individuals in this, you know, network that had these keen interests in UFOs and other kinds of arcane topics. A lot of the generals had been involved in Roswell. This would include uh, Nathan Twinning, who was considered, uh, who's also widely listed as a Majestic 12 member. Curtis LeMay, Bombs Away LeMay, who was probably Kubrick's inspiration for the character of uh, General Jack D. Ripper in Dr. Strangelove. LeMay was pretty crazy, to put it mildly. <laughs> Thomas Powers, I mean, some of these other generals in there. And then you had some other curious figures that became involved with the ASC pretty early in the game, like Stefan Posny, I believe that's how that name is pronounced. I could very well be butchering it, though, as I'm very bad at pronunciations. But um, Posny originally had promoted a lot of nationalist movements in first Austria and then later a few other European countries before the Nazis drove him to the United States. He was an absolutely fanatical proponent of eugenics and had tried to um, incorporate some of this into the U.S. Air Force after he ended up here. During the war, he worked with the Office of Naval Intelligence. Shortly afterwards, the war had ended. He became involved in a highly secretive UFO study group in the early 1950s that was not affiliated with Blue Book. This was an even more secretive Air Force group. I think it was simply known as something like the UFO study group or something to that effect. But after he joined the ASC, Posny would also hook up with Edward Teller, who, you know, also, I mean, throws up a lot in the UFO literature. Posny would come on to become a major proponent of what would become the strategic defense initiative, Star Wars. He would display a lot of interest in particle beam weapons and kinetic energy and things that are typically associated with Tesla weapons. Another figure who would end up in the ASC uh, National Security Council by the 1980s reputedly was Colonel Michael Aquino, who I'm sure a lot of your readers don't need much introduction to. He was, of course, the infamous founder of the Temple of Sets. So, you know, going back to at least the foundation of the ASC in the 1950s and kind of in proto-groups like that, such as the Committee on the Present Danger, Mach 1, which featured Vannover Bush and a lot of the other kind of architects of the uh, American military-industrial complex. These ties kind of began. I think a lot of it might have gone back to Roswell. Roswell, of course, there's a lot of interesting theories going on as to what actually happened in Roswell. I think one of the most compelling is put forth by Christopher Nolas and... Uh, his Lucifer's technology series, which he's kind of dubbed it the Roswell working. Mm -hmm. There may well have been some kind of magical uh, aspect of the uh, Roswell incident. Certainly the possibility would exist when you look at some of the other things that were going on at the same time. And interestingly, the intelligence agency that's most associated with the Roswell incident was the um, counterintelligence corps of the U S army the CIC, shortly after the Roswell incident, would become involved in the CIA's artichoke project. They had also been engaged in their own, quote unquote, enhanced interrogation methods prior to artichoke being launched with the um, a group that they had called the Rough Boys that specialized in special interrogations. There was another individual named Lee Baxter, who was also considered to be something of an architect of narco hypnosis and that type of thing, who worked with the CIC. And the CIC was also involved with the rat lines and what have you. So the CIC definitely seems to have been involved with a lot of arcane research in the years following the Second World War. And at the time when Roswell unfolded, the CIC, the CIA as it exists today did not exist at the time. There was a central intelligence group, but it was a pretty marginal institution the counterintelligence corps was one of the most powerful intelligence agencies we really had at the time. And they would have certainly been the repository of a lot of strange information at this era. So you have kind of this process where a lot of these CIC men were involved in Roswell. And then later on, you have the CIC men appearing in conjunction with Artichoke. Artichoke had a lot of ties to the far right. Uh, the kind of man who ultimately oversaw Project Artichoke was General Paul Gaynor, who managed the project out of um, the Office of Security, Security Research Staff. 
Gaynor was an absolutely fanatical right-wing extremist. He maintained what was known as the fag file in the CIA, which essentially chronicled known homosexuals in the U.S. government at the time. There are a lot of theories that he actually pushed several individuals towards suicide by threatening to expose their homosexuality. Gaynor actually specialized in general in sexual blackmail and entrapment, and he had appointed Morris Allen to oversee what was initially known as Bluebird and then later Artichoke, and Morris Allen was another guy who had a lot of ties to the far right as well. So you kind of have this sort of nexus where, you know, you had the Roswell incident, the Murray Island incident, these behavior modification experiments that the military and the CIA were kind of engaged in during the late 40s, and this kind of spilled over into this network of right-wing military officers and CIA officers who would later end up in these, you know, private organizations like the American Security Council and the World Anti-Communist League that would effectively be used to run intelligence operations covertly. So uh, does that answer your question? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man, the rabbit hole goes deep. Obviously, we're just scratching the surface, and it's already super complex. But Well, you said to me that a lot of this occult thinking and influence comes from uh, Julius Evola, right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, he seems to have been one of the strands of occult thought that uh, has sort of, you know, been churning through the far right now for at least half a century or so. From what I can tell, there were essentially three different branches of occultism that the far right has really embraced over the years. Evola would certainly be one of them. Another strain would be kind of the uh, Sinarchist slash the Martinists and what have you. And then finally, you would have the uh, Satanists and kind of use that phrase loosely because Satanism is such a it's used so widely now for so many different phenomena. It's almost a meaningless word. But when I'm saying Satanism here, I mean, in the kind of historical sense, the Satanism that emerged out of the Middle Ages and seems to have been closely affiliated with the Vatican throughout its history. So do you put Blavatsky in the Theosophy Society in any of those categories? Uh, Not exactly. I mean, Blavatsky in the Theosophy Society would sort of be a kind of proto-influence to a lot of these strains. Obviously, Blavatsky had a very strong influence on Martinism and Synarchy. I don't know how much Blavatsky would have directly i mean well obviously she would have had a certain degree of direct influence because theosophy was very popular in the early 20th century but i do think that a lot of theosophy was kind of distorted by uh the right as they kind of got into the occult scene more and more but i would kind of consider theosophy to be uh somewhat distinct i mean it's obviously an ideology that spawned a lot of different uh belief systems since it started to emerge in the late 19th century, so I don't know that it would be entirely fair to lump all theosophy in kind of a fascist section of um, occult phenomenon, certainly. Well, to focus on uh, Julius Evola, from what you said to me, it seems like you think that you have a theory that Evola is where Landon got the concept for the Black Sun that appeared in his Thule novels, and that, of course, is a major chunk of influence, but that's a source that I don't think a lot of people would be familiar with. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We see, Evola was a great admirer of the F- of the SS throughout the war years. He was originally bared from the SS because of um, Willigott, I believe that's how it pronounced, Carla Maria Willigott, who was for many years Himmler's kind of primary occult advisor until they had turned up some evidence of his mental instability, which uh, led to him being purged from the SS. But anyway, Evola was brought in around the late 1930s, possibly sooner. Towards the end of the war, uh, Evola was actually stationed in Vienna, excuse me, Salzburg, and this was the same city that Landig had ended up stationed in. And at the time, both men were working for the SD, which was the intelligence division of the SS. So they're basically in the same city working for the same division of the SS at the time. And there's a lot of mystery surrounding what exactly Evola was even doing for the SS then. He claimed that he had been writing a book that was um, a history of secret societies, the material of which was later lost to the Russians, apparently. And some people, such as Kevin Guggen, have theorized that Evola was in fact trying to develop a mythology for Nazi Germany after the war was over with. By this time, they generally felt that 
it was inevitable that they were going to lose. So they were already setting up the kind of post-war network for Nazism to survive, which, of course, plays into the rat lines and all this other stuff. But the theory is that Evelo had been tapped essentially to come up with a kind of mythology for this post-war Nazi movement. And certainly Landig does seem to have provided a lot of this post-war Nazi movement with a mythology. And obviously there was a lot of overt influence from Julius Evola in Landig's uh, ideology. Uh, Landig acknowledged this. But it might have gone into even more arcane concepts such as the Black Sun, which Landig and his kind of group are chiefly credited with introducing into the kind of esoteric Nazism. Evola would have been somebody who would have been a, probably would have been aware of such a concept. He never wrote about the Black Sun, but the Black Sun was a very arcane concept, even within a lot of occult circles until really the early uh, 90s, late 80s thereabouts. So I definitely think that there's a strong chance that Evola did have enormous influence on Landig's ideology and what's more. It might have been as part of some kind of intelligence agenda that went back to the Waifen SS and the waning years of World War II. Hmm. Interesting, man. And to get a little bit more into UFOs and the info that came out about them in the last few decades, many of these stories and whistleblowers do have connections to military intelligence. As you've said, the Bob Lazar story, the Philip Corso story. I mean, how likely is it that this was some distraction campaign to keep eyes away from occult rituals going on in the scientific and military communities like Jack Parsons and the Babylon working or you, what you mentioned earlier, Chris Knowles and what he calls the Roswell working. I mean, how likely is it that this was kind of a limited hangout operation to hide these kind of occult things? Oh, I definitely think that very much. I mean, that was yeah, what was being done, especially with the perception of UFOs that has been presented to the general public, namely that they're, you know, nuts and bolts spacecrafts that are piloted by extraterrestrial biological entities who, you know, decided to stop by here for a visit, even though in our own experience with space travel, we would have almost surely sent drones or something to that effect to investigate another planet. But yeah, and I mean, I think a lot of that also plays into the actual purpose of some of these behavior modification programs that were being conducted by the Pentagon and the CIA at the same time, too. I know Chris Nolas has speculated a lot, especially on, you know, the desire to dose so many people massively with LSD during the early 50s, especially since LSD's track record as a drug for mind control is pretty mediocre in all honesty and the cia continued to use it over and over again even though their attempts at eliciting mind control with it were not especially great based on some of the declassified accounts of this that i've read mm -hmm. so it does kind of beg the question why did they keep doing this over and over again and did at some point did somebody start to wonder about the nature of the visions that they were seeing if there was something more to the visions themselves and it kind of raises the broader questions, well, you know, then why was it released so broadly to the general public? I mean, the conspiratorial right has long assumed that this was, again, another part of an elaborate mind control plot. But was it actually part of a, an attempt for consciousness expansion and a consciousness expansion that was related to the UFO phenomenon? Certainly, um, in the early years of Artichoke, they had two goals that were rather interesting one of them was to develop more effective means of interrogation which is rather self-explanatory but another goal was to create what was referred to as more aggressive soldiers which nowadays would be referred to as super soldiers right and that that's something i wanted to uh make a point about because when you're writing and talking about chris's idea of a roswell working he points out how the Roswell incident mirrors the Greek myth of Cadmus and the Martian well, and you note that when it comes to the beings that emerged from the well, I was not reminded of reptiles. Rather, I was struck by how much they resembled enhanced or super soldiers. And it just so happens, dear reader, that one of the primary objectives of Bluebird and later Artichoke was the creation of super soldiers. So, you know, I just wanted to throw that in there, too, because it ties in and... I mean, it's nuts. What, what do you think is going on here? This mirroring of ancient myth within the deep state. 
Well, I think a lot of it kind of breaks down to psychic phenomenon. I mean, certainly it seems like a part of the Super Soldier Project was uh, to investigate psychic phenomenon and that later kind of manifested in the, you know, Project Skrill Flame and Stargate and what have you that were related, related to remote viewing. And of course, with the UFO phenomenon, there's been a lot of speculation that it's closely related to psychic phenomenon. Of course, a lot of people have reported instances of telepathy and what have you when having close encounters and what have you. And there are even some theories that the spaceships or the UFOs themselves are not physically there. There's some kind of astral projection or something of that nature as a means of visiting the planet or visiting it from wherever they're coming from rather than actually sending a physical craft there. It's some kind of, you know, mental phenomenon, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, we're talking a little bit about artichoke and you also write about the nine a bit. And when it comes to the political corporate and military elite contacting non-human entities, the story of Andrea Paharich, the seance with the council of nine, it's gotta be one of my favorite stories. This group of elite contact these nine multidimensional beings hovering in an invisible spaceship that want to influence world events. We've talked about the basics of the story with Peter Lavenda and Gordon White. But you say that from your study, the ties between the Nine and the Office of Security and Project Artichoke are grossly underreported. So what can you tell us about that and why it might be important? Well, yeah, uh, again, you know, the Office of Security was, of course, the agency that had overseen Artichoke. It was not the TSS, as is commonly uh, claimed. And another thing I should probably make a point here that, I mean, is very rarely mentioned, but. Artichoke was not rolled into MK Ultra. Artichoke continued to function after MK Ultra was initiated and appears to have continued to at least the early 60s. Probably was finally wrapped up around the same time that MK Ultra was wrapping up in 1963. And then on top of that, Puharic has long been believed to have been involved in MK Ultra, and he does seem to have had some kind of ties to it, but as uh, both H.P. Alborelia's Terrible Mistake and, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the other book right now, but it's on the uh, stage magician John Maholland. It also makes clear from recovered uh, Freedom of Information Act documents that Puharic actually was involved with Artichoke and not MK Ultra. And in point of fact, uh, the MK Ultra crew seems to have had some real reluctancy towards Puharic's um, theories. And that also raises some interesting possibilities there. I mean, Puharic, when he began with psychic research and what have you, he did it with the Round Table Group. And the Round Table Group certainly brought together an interesting cross-section of kind of Eastern establishment elites and military intelligence officers. Puharic, from that, was later brought into the deep state, into the military and the uh, CIA, you know, behavior modification experiments. And then he did something that greatly upset John Maholland, who was a stage musician, who was uh, a consultant for MK Ultra. Nobody really knows what exactly this is, but anyway, Maholland went out of his way to essentially drum Puharic out of the behavior modification experiments in the mid 50s. And Maholland was also very close to Nelson Rockefeller, and as Chris Nolas kind of explained in his own account of the nine, Puharic would later run afoul of the Rockefellers in the 1980s as well with his attempts to try to come up with an alternative to oil for fuel. So Puharic seems to have had a lot of issues with the Rockefeller group over the years. And that's not entirely surprising when you sort of look at what the Rockefellers have supported in the New Age community, quote unquote. They tend to seem to prefer the most... Well, basically, they've usually gone with more of like the nuts and bolts explanations of the UFO phenomenon, and they almost seem to prefer a kind of atheistic approach to the New Age movement, typically stripping a lot of these spiritual practices of their, you know, innate spirituality and trying to reduce them to almost like a psychological state. But I'm going off topic. <laughs> but um, anywho, I think that there was definitely kind of a division in the deep state over Puharic with some people kind of you know, feeling like that what he was doing was incredibly radical, some people thinking it was totally fraudulent and what have you. And that probably played into, you know, kind of some of the shakeup that went in in these projects at the time. Of course, Sidney Gottlieb was kind of elevated to the top of the litter with MK Ultra. 
And contrary to what you sort of hear, uh, Gottlieb actually wound down a lot of the LSD testing and what have you during his tenure is kind of the main agency directing this kind of thing from 1955 to 63. And while he did investigate some degree of psychic phenomena and what have you, it was not nearly to the extent that Arthur Choke did. So it was kind of an interesting situation where you had this kind of period from the late 40s to the early 50s where the military and the CIA were really going into a lot of very, very strange topics. And then when the Rockefeller money kind of got involved with MK Ultra in the mid 50s, they tended to start disengaging themselves from a lot of these projects until the mid 1960s when you had the initiation of MK Often and then later Grill Flame, which eventually became Stargate and it kind of started back up again which was around the same time that Piharic himself was kind of brought back into the deep state with the uh, Harry Geller, you know, phenomenon and what have you. So there does seem to have been some kind of conflict between elements of the national security establishment over, you know, what to do with this kind of information that they were uncovering. And I suspect kind of the hard scientific wing just didn't even want to really deal with it, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah, Paharch is definitely a interesting character. If you've ever seen that show, One Step Beyond, the episode he did with Gordon Wasson, where they go down and they take magic mushrooms on the air on black and white television in an era where a husband and wife couldn't even sleep in the same bed together. It was just such a weird thing to see on TV. And uh, Paharch, yeah, was into a lot of crazy stuff, but The Nine being one of those favorite stories it's a provocative idea, but how far do you think the influence of those beings got? Well, I mean, it certainly, you know, appears that it was very, very advanced into the American state. I mean, of course, a lot of, you know, a lot of information has come out about their ties to the Kennedy assassination. Of course, Peter Labendia was really at the forefront of that. And then in my own series, I kind of found out that there were a lot of indirect links to Watergate as well. To kind of briefly summarize that, part of the plumber's team, the guy who seems to have really bungled the Watergate break-in was James McCord. And James McCord was himself a veteran of the Office of Security. He had worked for Gaynor and Morris Allen going back to the 1940s when McCord was in the FBI. And McCord, I don't know if he was involved in Artichoke, but there's a strong possibility that he was in some capacity. He appears to have been the agent the Office of Security dispatched to investigate and or cover up Frank Olson's death, depending upon, you know, what you choose to believe in that matter. But McCord definitely seems to have been very close to this, you know, group of Artichoke people who oversaw the project, and in the same token, Morris Allen was also Pew Horrocks' major patron within, you know, the intelligence community at that time as well. So you fast forward to the time of Watergate. McCord seems to have been running some kind of sexual blackmail operation, which I had kind of hinted at earlier, was a real specialty of the Office of Security, and that kind of led to the Watergate break-in and ultimately the downfall of Nixon's presidency. But I was definitely struck by the fact that, I mean, certainly, you know, you don't have a lot of degrees of separation between Hugh Harik, who had contacted the nine to McCord, the only real degree of separation being Morris Allen. And this is kind of the same thing that you find in the Kennedy assassination where, you know, Marina Oswald was staying with the stepson, I believe it was, of Arthur Young, who was another one of the individuals who had channeled the Nine with Buharic back in the uh, early 1950s. So, yeah, it's just, you know, incredible that two of the really defining political events in the United States of the second half of the 20th century, i.e. the Kennedy assassination and Watergate, you have the presence of these, you know, alleged beings not very far in the background. And, you know, and certainly, I mean, this kind of underlined, I mean, a generally turbulent era for the United States in general. So, yeah, <laughs> it definitely makes you wonder just what exactly, you know, philosophies were being bannered about in the ruling elite at the time, certainly. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, uh, you know, I also like when you talk about the idea that everybody knows MK Ultra, but they don't know these other things like Project Bluebird, Project Artichoke, MK Often. And it does seem like, 
it was a situation where they took all these deep state projects going on at the time and they just, as soon as MK Ultra was exposed, they just tossed it all under that umbrella and let it be the scapegoat and said, oh, this is all over. And it was all just this one program and that's it. And I think that might be a way they covered their tracks uh, for a lot of this stuff. Well, absolutely. And then also, uh, I think specifically too, Sidney Gottlieb was really hung out to dry by the CIA. There's a very interesting anecdote that H.P. Alborelia recounts in A Terrible Mistake. It was a, I believe, either a letter exchange or a conversation he had had with John Marks, who uh, was the individual who wrote in search of the Manchurian Candidate, which was the first expose of these types of projects. I mean, it wasn't the very first one, but it was the first really full-length book account of it. But anyway, Marx had filed the Freedom of Information Acts and what have you, which led to the original documentation coming out on MK Ultra and these other projects. And in the first batch of documentation he got, every single name was blacked out. <laughs> every one, except Sidney Gottlieb's. Uh. That was the only name <laughs> and the whole thing that they gave him. And Gottlieb is perceived as this, you know, black sorcerer in the CIA who was involved in these just, you know, every arcane project. And yet the CIA did nothing to protect him. I mean, he was the first person who they really hung out, I mean, for the MK Ultra experiment. So to me, that definitely raises the question of like, well, why Gottlieb if he was involved in, you know, so much secretive work? Uh, I definitely think the reason why Gottlieb and MK Ultra were sort of selected to be the ones that, uh, you know, took the fall for these other experiments is because, well, there, I think, were effectively two reasons. On the one hand, I think that there was more legal loopholes to exploit with the MK Ultra experiments. A lot of the experiments were sort of done with quasi volunteers. And then even in the cases of some of the experiments that were, such as the, you know, infamous Cameron medical experiments that were conducted in Canada, the women in those experiments had volunteered to be treated by Cameron. They were largely people who admitted themselves for, you know, psychiatric treatment. And they knew that Cameron was involved in, you know, radical procedures. Obviously, they did not know that he was doing these experiments on behalf of the CIA. But there was some, you know, legal legal room with this kind of stuff. Whereas with Artichoke, for instance, they seem to have done a lot of experiments on prisoners and military men and what have you who were given no choice in any of this. They were not in many cases aware that they were even being performed experiments upon. So there were, I think, legal considerations for this. And then the other one, which the other reason why I think MK Ultra was really hung out as the main one, which is also interesting, is because MK Ultra was totally overseen by the CIA. Artichoke and often by contrast were joint Pentagon and CIA experiments. And the general perception is that the CIA led the Pentagon around by the nose in these experiments. And I don't think though that that's a very accurate description of the relationship. Obviously, the Pentagon had been doing these experiments that predated the CIA and even the foundation of the CIA. Hmm. So I think certainly in revealing MK Ultra, there was also an attempt to try to cover up the you know extent that the Pentagon had also been involved in this type of research. And you also mentioned on your blog that Gottlieb was Jewish. Do you think that has any real significance in him being thrown under the bus? Yeah, yeah. There was also, I mean, of course, there's a lot of you know, information out there that there was quite a bit of anti-Semiticism in, you know, some of the early CIA sections. And yes, there does seem to have been a certain degree of resentment towards Gottlieb as a Jew. He was sort of a golden boy who rose very high in the ranks fast. And I do think there were probably some people at the CIA that were resentful of that. And then after MK Ultra kind of surpassed Artichoke as the primary vehicle for these experiments, Definitely a lot of the Office of Security personnel, I think, were very bitter about this. And to kind of begin with, already men like Paul Gaynor and Morris Allen had displayed strong traces of anti-Semiticism even prior to encountering Gottlieb. I mean, both Gaynor and Morris Allen were friends with John Trevor, who had been a military intelligence officer during the First World War. Trevor had actually developed a battle plan for rounding up every Jew in New York City during the First World War. So 
Yeah, these guys were definitely around some pretty extreme anti-Semites, and that definitely could have played into the decision to really hang Gottlieb out to dry. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty interesting element because I kind of started this off with, uh, you know, your quote about the lines between Kabbalism and Nazism being fairly blurred. And anti-Semitism is an interesting thing to me because I have no dog in the fight at all in terms of like caring what anybody's race is or any kind of superiority agenda in that regard. But when it comes to groups of people that work together behind the scenes to control the global stage... This is obviously one group that is talked about a lot. It's just curious because at that upper level, you would think that some of that anti-Semitism would kind of fade away because they're more in uh, in concert together or they're more interconnected. But I guess uh, I guess not. Yeah, no, I definitely would say, especially amongst the, you know, kind of Anglo-American elite. I mean, yes, there was always a certain wariness uh, of the Jewish elites. And then, of course, I think another kind of factor that played into that, too, is the fact that, how can I put this delicately? Um, Certainly, there were a fair amount of Jews in the United States in the early to mid 20th century that were also involved in organized crime and that type of thing. Mir Lansky, of course, who was for many years the financier for the syndicate, uh, was a prominent Jew who later fled to Israel briefly to avoid prosecution. There was... um, Oh, Lefty Rosenthal, I believe his name was, who was the inspiration for the Robert De Niro character in Casino and so on. So definitely some of the you know Jewish families had acquired their money in somewhat criminal enterprises, which I think put a certain taint to them in the eyes of the you know more prim and proper Anglo-American establishment as well. Hmm. So... Yeah, there were a lot of these kind of factors that played into it. And then as I kind of got into earlier as well, there seems to have been a lot more pronounced Anglo or excuse me, uh, anti-Semiticism in some of the European partners of this sort of elite network. America, that wasn't quite as pronounced, I would say. Right. I try to think of it as like um, and within these high level networks, I kind of think of it as a Game of Thrones where imagine you just discover someone is a bonesman. You might be a little more skeptical because you're going to think, oh, well, this person's going to have an allegiance to their group within the group before anything else. And if you're not part of that group, you're going to maybe be a little paranoid that they're ready to stab you in the back. So I kind of try to think of the Jewish elite in the same way is that they're definitely working with Germans and fascists and Nazis, but maybe all these groups are kind of looking at what smaller groups, you know, wheels within wheels that these people are part of and saying, well, I know that's your true allegiance. So you might be um, smiling at me out of one corner of your mouth with a knife behind your back. I don't know. I, I kind of try to think of it. Maybe that's the source of anti-Semitism amongst that level. If we had a similar word like anti-bonesmen, you might see the same type of sentiment. There just isn't really a term to describe that type of prejudice. Well, yeah, I think to some extent, and I mean, in the case of the Jewish elites, I mean, I definitely think that, you know, I mean, as a people, the Jews are definitely much more cliquish, shall we say, than certain other groups. And again, I think in a lot of ways, that's totally understandable when you look at the history that they've endured. And that may also be a kind of in the minds of other elites as well. Well, are Jews really going to turn on other Jews when you sort of look at the shared historic experiences of persecution that they have for centuries? And so, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of factors that play into, you know, where people's allegiances ultimately lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those things are going to reinforce themselves too. like persecution is going to happen because you notice the clickiness and then increased clickiness is going to happen because you notice the persecution. So it really is like a, back and forth chicken and egg kind of thing that reinforces itself, I guess, all throughout history. Yes, yes, definitely. Hmm. Well, okay, so if most of these programs were an exploration of consciousness, mind control, psychedelics, potentially the opening of other realms and magic and contacting disembodied Egyptian gods, by the time we hit the 70s, 80s, 90s, the trail sort of runs dry with the exception of the disinfo campaigns around ufology, but what can be said about these programs themselves or the continuing of this occult exploration in more recent decades? Well, I definitely think a lot of it went into the deep privates. Definitely, this seems to have been the case. 
uh, the pace of it, I think, really stepped up, especially in the 1980s after the, you know, Iran-Contra exposés and what have you. Really, the trail of a lot of this stuff kind of starts to go cold after then. But it seems like a lot of it was picked up by Robert Bigelow, the uh, kind of Nevada real estate mogul who eventually got into private space flight. That's at least the kind of public perception. But I mean, Bigelow has also spent a lot of money promoting UFOlogy in various forms, and he's gotten into some very arcane research, such as the Skinwalker Ranch. It's been what well, he did is, from as far as I can tell, he did own the Skinwalker Ranch for many years. Bigelow might have finally deinvested himself from it for the last two or three or something to that effect, but certainly they do seem to have done some serious investigations there. There were some heavy hitters that were linked to it, such as Colonel John Alexander, and that, I think, is one instance of going into the 90s where you can kind of see how these projects, you know, continued. As I mean, with the Skinwalker Ranch, well, there are some theories that this might have been a gateway into another dimension or something to that effect. It's also kind of interesting where we're going with this. Bigelow, of course, came out as a major backer of Trump. Well, I shouldn't say major, but he did so some support to Trump in the lead up to the 2016 election, as did Elon Musk, who is the other major backer for private space flight and that type of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's some interesting developments that be coming from that, especially since in general, Trump, you know, seems like he's very close to some of these private intelligence networks, certainly. I mean, he's had a lot of advice from Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater. There are, of course, rumors circulating that he was trying to get, um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, but the CEO of Cerebus, which owns DynCorp, to review the U.S. intelligence community. So I definitely think that a lot of it has continued in the deep private. And under Trump, we may well see this really going into overdrive with some of the backers that he had coming into the White House. Oh, yeah, man. And I did want to talk to you a little bit about Trump because you've written about him recently and the back and forth going on in the current political circus. And so when it comes to the idea of a division among the elite, you know, it really has been a popular thing this whole election cycle right up to today. We had so much alternative media support for Trump that Alex Jones and shows like Red Ice are in support of the president, yeah, which yeah. is totally backwards than it's always been. And I was happy to see Clinton defeated, but I'm skeptical about anyone that they, quote unquote, let become president. And that said, the nonstop media attacks and the constant pressure has shown them picking apart the administration to some degree. And now just a couple months in, we got the airstrikes in Syria, the Moab drop in Afghanistan. It seems like this let's stay home and put America first attitude has flipped to full blown globalism. What's going on here? Are we dealing with real coups and counter coups and infighting, or is this just another case of simulated opposition? Well, it's definitely difficult to say at this point still, I think. In my opinion, the real cusp of the dispute over elements of the deep state and what have you with Trump really had to deal with a question of theaters, I guess. Uh, essentially, the Hillary backers seem to have preferred to continue the pressure on Russia which has been building, obviously, throughout Barack Obama's administration, whereas it seems like some of the hawks who backed Trump were much more concerned with the rise of China. So kind of going into present events that are unfolding right now, initially Trump kind of surprised everyone by launching these airstrikes on Syria, but conversely, he did them literally at the same time he was having dinner with the president of China, and ever since this particular incident unfolded, you've seen some major reversals coming out of China. Uh, of course, they've, you know, started to step up pressure on North Korea. But I mean, also, they've uh, tentatively talked about doing some big economic concessions to the United States in terms of lifting restrictions on the selling of U.S. beef there on trying to buy more U.S. products. And probably most interestingly, uh, opening up their securities and insurance companies to ownership by foreign individuals. So I definitely think there's still kind of an ongoing dispute unfolding within, you know, these different factions of the deep state over what poses the greater threat to Pax Americana, whether it's Russia, whether it's China. Certainly the Hillary backers were in the Russia camp, and that would be kind of consistent with the kind of historic Eastern establishment who has long been obsessed with Europe. They kind of consider it to be the backbone of 
American global power, whereas conversely, I think there are other groups that are far more interested in Asia at this point. They largely see Europe as kind of a wasteland and the future basically unfolding in the Far East, which, you know, with the rise of China's economy, probably isn't a bad assumption. <laughs> Right on. And I also wanted to talk to you about Jared Kushner because you've written about him and he does kind of make this uh, idea of coups and counter coups seem like it's really one big family and less about competing factions because he is Trump's son-in-law. He's considered a major force behind the campaign. He bought 666 Fifth Avenue across from Rockefeller Plaza. His startup company was funded by George Soros and you refer to him as the chief liaison between the Trump people and the Jewish elite. I mean, what else can be said about him and his role in this thing? Well, yeah, that really seems to have been, you know, his major purpose. I mean, I believe Kushner played a big role in getting Trump some financial backing for Sheldon Adelson. I believe his name is the, um, you know, casino mogul and what have you. So, yeah, and I mean, I think that probably plays into Trump's kind of seeming reverse course on Syria. My understanding is that, you know, Israel was obsessed with overthrowing Iran's current government. And, you know, obviously part of that campaign would be destabilizing Syria. So, yeah, I mean, there's kind of these regional influences that are playing into that. And then there may even be a current divide now within the National Security Council over that. Uh, this kind of perception seems to be that it's H.R. McMasters who's really pushing for the escalation and uh, puts... I think somewhere between 50 and 150,000 boots on the ground in Syria versus James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, and Joseph Dunford, I believe, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who in the past have been very reluctant about escalating the situation in Syria from comments they've made and are reported to now be the ones who are still very tentative about how far we want to go in Syria. So certainly, I mean, there seems to be from what I can tell, still an ongoing dispute over, you know, do we want to try to really push things in Syria as far as they can go, or do we want to try to keep the pressure on China or what? Mm -hmm. And I mean, certainly with Trump's own particular nature, I could definitely see scenarios where he could do another dramatic 180 at some point, too. Stephen Bannon, for instance, seems to have been, you know, on the outs in the administration. But again, with just the way things have played out, it could be in a few months, Kushner might be the one on the outside looking in. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess we are in the middle of the story, so you can't draw too many conclusions about it. But you do bring up the idea of Trump and his back and forth on who he's taking his cues from. And you bring up the idea of a possible blackmail situation, which is something that's come up before. Earlier, you mentioned sexual blackmail. That's very much a theme today. Pedophilia among the elite is a pretty hot topic, even in mainstream circles, even if they're just calling it fake news, but at least it's out there. I mean, the terms are being talked about. I think that has an effect, but what are your thoughts on blackmail actually playing into the strings that are being pulled behind the Trump administration? Well, yeah, I definitely think it's been a key role in certainly his rise to power. I mean, Eric Prince came out, you know, shortly before the election and essentially indicated that the uh, New York Police Department was on the verge of prosecuting Anthony Weiner on charges related to pedophilia. And Weiner, of course, was uh, married to a key Hillary aide. That probably played a factor in her, you know, ultimate loss of the election. And then more recently, you kind of have the mayor of Seattle who was suddenly implicated in, you know, molestation of several kids several years ago, who has been a major opponent of Trump and his policies and immigration. But then again, you know, I also think there's a possibility that Trump himself might be implicated in this. Of course, there's allegations that he also took trips to Epstein Island, mm -hmm. where I believe what the legal age of consent was 12 or something to that effect. Bill Clinton, of course, was linked to this, and that was a big issue in the campaign. So, yeah, I could definitely see, you know, I mean, somebody having something on Trump as well. Certainly, Trump comes off as an individual who's been engaged in a certain degree of sexual decadence throughout his life. So, <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, of course, you get back into some of his, well, I mean, his sort of deep state mentor was most likely Roy Kuhn, who had started out as a uh, attorney for McCartney during the 1950s. And 
there have been allegations going around for years that Kuhn was also involved in running sexual blackmail rings, possibly involving children for the CIA. Uh, so Trump might have been, you know, initiated into this world going as far back as possibly the 1970s. Wow, man. Well, we have covered a hell of a lot of ground. Is there anything else on the horizon or anything that you're seeing or paying particular attention to down the line that we should address before we start wrapping it up? <laughs> really, at this point, I'm just hoping we don't get into a third world war in the coming, you know, months. <laughs> mm. Amen. Yeah, it's it definitely all we can do is kind of sit on the sidelines and wait and see what they got in store. But I'm hoping so, too. Yeah, there's no need for that. Yeah. <laughs> Although, well, I whenever mean, there's from our economic... point of Oh, sorry to say, but whenever there's uh, whispers of economic trouble, you know that a, a giant, massive military conflict is right around the corner. Well, yeah. And I mean, well, not just that, too. But I mean, I also just think the fact that credibility in public institutions is just collapsed so much, not just in the United States, but in Europe and so many other areas of the world right now. I mean, the public does not trust, you know, politicians. They don't trust the press. There's hardly anybody left that they do trust. So I, I think that's another kind of driving factor for a major war with the elite or the another factor that's driving the elites towards a major war right now is they need something that's going to reestablish authority in the state or something to that effect. Because, I mean, right now there's just so much public disconnect with or discontent with the way things are. And I think there is a realization that. If it continues in the current path, you know, sooner or later, somebody is going to get elected or come to some kind of power that's not going to be another Trump that can be, you know, easily manipulated by the powers that be. So I definitely think the push to a war is also to try to preempt, you know, some kind of genuine political change that may occur down the line. So, I mean, certainly my major hope is that we can avoid a major war at this point so that we can get to the possibility where a real chance of change does present itself. Mm, very well said, man. So, yeah, I'm right there with you. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Let's keep our guard up and keep our eyes open for just this kind of manipulation. But that pretty much does it for us. Recluse, I do love the work you're doing. I'm so glad Chris Knowles turned me on to your blog. It's very much in the same vein as his. Great stuff. Before I really cut you loose, tell the people a little bit more about it if they want to get more into these things. Uh, well, like I said, you can find my website at, uh, visupview.com. That's, uh, V-I-S-U-P-V-U, V-I-E-W.com, or excuse me, dot blogspot.com. Essentially, yeah, I chronicle a lot of, uh, deep political intrigues, a lot of, you know, arcane topics. I also do some pop culture oriented things on music and movies and that type of stuff, but not as much in the last year. So, yeah, I guess if you've enjoyed the webcast, uh, if you also enjoy some other things that you see on the Secret Sun or Rune Soup, you may be interested in my blog. Certainly, I would consider uh, Mr. Nullis and Mr. White to be enormous influences on my work. I also actually would like to take this moment, too, to give a big thank you to Chris Nolis for promoting my website among his readers and what have you. Uh, obviously, you know, turning you onto my website and what have you. It definitely means a lot to me. I have a great degree of respect for the work that Chris Nolis has done over the last decade or so. And, you know, it's very gratifying that he seems to enjoy the work that I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, man. I even saw Peter Lavenda himself commented on a couple of your posts that involved his work. That's uh, something cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I've uh, had some contact with Venda. I've had some contact with HP Alborelia. Usually I've talked to Alborelia in email exchanges and what have you. So that's definitely been exciting to have some contact with some of the researchers that really inspired my work. Uh, it's been very gratifying and probably one of the most rewarding aspects of doing the blog. <laughs> Amen, man. I hear you. I feel like I'm talking to people every week that I'm not qualified to be talking to, but <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. And right on, I had a great time talking to you. Thanks again. Keep fighting the good fight, my man. Uh, thanks a lot for having me on. You got it. And boom goes the dynamite, dear listeners. Recluse of Babylon. Drop in knowledge. And I do have to apologize for the audio quality a little bit. I know we had connection problems with the internet that would just screw up like one word out of every other sentence, and then it would go away for a while. And there are parts that I had to stitch together to sound more fluid, and there are parts that sound like bad edits, but I actually didn't touch anything. So a little subpar on the audio quality, but 
when it's like that, it's hard to keep interrupting a person's flow. And I just tend to think, oh, I'm going to fix it later. And then I go back and it bothers me more than I thought it would. But it is what it is. Serenity now, right? Recluse does know what he's talking about, though, in terms of content and mapping out all these connections. I feel like he's got to have one of the most elaborate detective show cork boards up in his head. It's pretty impressive. And being a guy who doesn't do many interviews, especially a lengthy one like these here higher side chats, I think he did a great job. This really is just one of my attempts to find some new voices that still mesh with this nexus of the occult and the deep state, and I don't want to just go over the same stories, so I try to find people who have looked at different aspects or highlight different details of that stuff that I like about Gordon White and Chris Knowles. And yeah, Recluse was pretty committed to Chris Knowles, but I've always said Knowles, and I never really thought anything about it, but now he's got me second-guessing myself. But anyway, it's just one of my big curiosities is that in the conspiracy world, we hear the buzzword Kabbalah. We hear about old Jewish magic. And yes, that is there, but it's the Bush family doing the skull and bone stuff. It's the Nazis who are the most open about the occult in anyone alive today's lifetime. And it's German petrochemical companies that are at the heart of a lot of today's problems. So I don't know if someone was really going to try and say that my show hides the Jewish agenda. I mean, that might be fair because it has been a long time since we did a Jews run the world show, mainly just because I think that stuff is outdated to a degree or maybe only applies to banking circles. Not that it's wrong, but I think that people in that camp have blinders on to other things like this really easy to track largely German, Prussian, nationalist, fascist faction like Henry Ford, for example who worked heavily with the Rockefellers and the oil barons who spawned the assembly line and helped craft an education system that reduced people to believing that being a screw turner is a fulfilling life. He wrote a book called The International Jew, and I bought it because I want to understand this weird element of the situation among the elites. And it's everything you might expect. How Jews use power, Jewish supremacy in cinema, Jewish usury, the Jew world order, perpetual victimhood. And I just find it interesting coming from him because he's a real dick. And I also thought that when we say Jewish elite, that included families like Rockefeller. Yet he seemed pretty cozy with them. And some say the highest elite are just German Jews who use that division the same way they use Democrats and Republicans. Honestly, I guess I'm really just not that good at eyeing someone up and knowing if they're Jewish. Unless we're talking about like Larry David and Woody Allen. So I don't know. But I do know that the reason our food and medicine and vaccines are all fucked is petrochemical companies. And that's Nazi eugenics residue, my friends, as far as I can tell. But maybe we will do a show for the other side before too long. I want to be balanced, but I actually don't know the best researcher to get on for the Jewish agenda side anymore. So you tell me. Anyway, I hope you liked this one and I hope it filled out a few more areas on your deep state map. I think Recluse is right about the distrust being so high right now that they're going to want a distraction event. We've seen it before. And we recorded the show just before Comey was fired from the FBI. That's why you didn't hear it mentioned. But I'm sure this saga also has the administration looking for a bigger tragedy than their shady operation. So be awake. Be ready. You do not know the hour when World War III is coming. And if you like the first hour here... Of course, there's always a second if you sign up for THC+. Plus. It's $5 a month for five extra hours and lifetime access to the forums. There are three-month, six-month, full-year options, recurring, non-recurring, check, money order, Bitcoin, whatever. I want to make it easy, so get on the ride. In this second hour, we talked about the impact of China's decision to open up their securities and insurance companies to foreign ownership how Recluse balances the positive personal experiences with psychedelics with the knowledge of deep state connections around the psychedelic movement and that the introspection facilitated by these compounds probably didn't line up all that well with deep state agendas. I really liked that part. We talked about how Recluse takes issue with the trend of conspiracy researchers focusing on the distribution of entheogens rather than opioids, considering how much more damaging they are as these opioids are the ones that are synthesized and pushed by Big Pharma. 
We got into the strange history of events along the 33rd parallel and how that relates to the idea of a Faustian pact or the potential for some type of spirit bargaining by elements of the American machine. The true nature of the elite and entity connection. Are they in conscious contact or infected by a parasitic mind virus? Why it's interesting that William Shockley specifically would be chosen as the inventor of the transistor if it was in fact a ruse to hide a more occult origin. We talked about Secret Wars Vatican Edition where we got into the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta. Also how Skull and Bones dominates the military industrial complex and the death of David Rockefeller and how that might affect the power structure and the plans of the elite. Other stuff as well. It's action packed. Quite a bit of stuff I enjoyed. So big thanks again to Recluse. I did like his point about LSD not being that great for mind control, but maybe it is good for other agendas like trying to gain insight or map other realms. I think that's a great point. But anyway, do check out his blog, visupview.blogspot.com, V-I-S-U-P-V-I-E-W.blogspot.com. Just look in the show notes. He's already put up a new installment of his High Weirdness in the Far Right series. I'm sure that's a good read. I already see the Skull and Bones logo here. (laughs) And also, I haven't done this in a while, but playing us out today is a band called Seven Day Sleep because they asked if I could close out a show with their song, Red Lipstick Murders. And I thought it was a pretty great song, so I'm happy to do that. I want artists out there to make it, especially if they like this crazy show, right? But that does it for me today. I am getting out of here. Your move, deep state, dimensional door openers, underground occult fascist factions of the far right, and the interdimensional entities of the other world that you work with. Your fucking move. Seven day sleep. They took away the brides of hell to the riverside. I heard that all my sisters cried. They burned a man and watched them die. Oh, sis.